of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you. Well, they got to do something. But the crowd knows that this fellow has been healed. And so they got to be careful here. Because, you know, they're, they're like the good politicians. You know? So they tell him, look, I'm going to let you go this time. But you need to shut up. You need to stop talking about this guy, Jesus. You understand? Now, beloved, understand, they're not talking to a court that can find them in contempt of court and put them in jail. They're standing before a court that can kill them, having them stoned to death, or any other way. But mostly it's stoned. They're really in the face of authority and danger. Go over to verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to him, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Even in the face of overwhelming power, Peter still is courageous. My, oh my. Not only, not only does he live his life like God wants him to, a holy life before people, before the whole public, but he'll even stand up to the authorities and tell them, I don't care what you say. We're going to do what we got to do. Where did that come from? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in Peter doing his work. We say, well, you know what? The Holy Spirit is in Peter, but you know, eventually he's going to be martyred. Yeah, we'll look at that. I'm not ignorant of it. But let's go to chapter Acts chapter 12, verse 6. Finally, the leadership gets sick and tired of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Herod, in order, you know, there's this, there's this brouhaha starting because the Jews, the Jewish people who refuse to accept their Messiah and become, if you will, completed Jews or Messianic Jews, they're causing trouble. And so whatever happened, uh, it led up to the point where Herod, the king, had James killed, the apostle James, not the brother of Jesus, the apostle. See, he's a brother of James, half-brother of James, born to Mary, fathered by Joseph. He becomes the leader of the church. That's the book of James, when you read the book of James. This is the apostle James. He has him killed. Well, the people like that. You know, it's like a holiday to them. Ah, yay! So he decides he's going to have Peter killed, too. But it's a holiday. It's some kind of a holiday. And Peter's locked up in prison. He's chained to a soldier on each side. There's two more soldiers outside the door of his cell. And he's going to die in the morning. Don't know how he's going to die. I don't know if he's going to be beheaded. Probably beheaded. And look at what it says in Chapter 12, verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping. What? That's where I want you to stop, right there. Peter was sleeping. Let me ask you something. If you went home today and you got arrested or something, and they said, we're going to take you out in the backyard and shoot you tomorrow. You're dead. Would you sleep? He's sleeping. No means to escape. He's chained on this side to this guy, and he's chained on this side to this guy. He's locked in a cell with two guards outside. Nobody's going to come and, and 
deliver him. He knows his brothers and sisters are not going to raid the prison and deliver him. You know, they're not going to help him escape. He's going to die in the morning. And he's asleep. In fact, the angel comes to wake him up, to take him out. And the angel has to tell him, hurry up. I mean, it's not like he's so excited. Oh, I'm getting out of here. You know, it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I am sleeping my eye. Hurry up, the angel says. Put your sandals on. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not like the world gives, but my peace I give. Where'd that come from? The Holy Spirit. Amen. That's where. It's the Holy Spirit in Peter. We know this is not Peter's nature. We already saw Peter's nature. This has changed. This is a whole new life. Now, eventually, Peter was martyred. Where did he go? When they martyred him? Where'd he go? This is a bad thing? See, we have to understand something, beloved. This life is good, but it's not the goodest. It gets gooder. Now, we can't expedite that. We're not allowed to expedite that. God says don't expedite that. In fact, that's why he doesn't reveal how wonderful heaven is. You know, when they do an advertisement for Disney World, they take you through the park, you know, show the people, oh, you know. Well, God don't want you to do it because you'd be real hard-pressed not to just take your own life, and that God won't allow. He's got plans for you. He's got to use you. There's a plan afoot, and you're part of it. So you got to submit to the Holy Spirit and let him do his work in you. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, and rest on him knowing that he has everything in control. Amen. And just let him do in you what he wants to do and, and, and enjoy the fullness, the abundant life he gives you. Right. You know, abundant life is not money and the things it can buy. Abundant life is living with purpose. Having a meaning to your life. Greeks call it talos. It's why are you here? Just heard something real cute about that. The acorn, its purpose is to become an oak tree. The reality of it, beloved, is you too have a purpose. I have a purpose. And we're not the same. God uses you in your world, in your sphere. And he uses you for his good pleasure to bring him glory so that more will come to him and be relieved and forgiven. And the moment you just sell out to that, the better your life becomes. Do, no. Will there be times when you will shed tears? Yes. Will there be times when you feel bad? Yes. Will there be times when you won't be able to sleep at night? Yes, probably. But deep down inside, there'll be an understanding. There's a reason for this. That's the new life. Not like theirs, but like God wants you to have. Amen. Beloved, there's nothing better than that. Now, what's the difference? What was the difference between when the, he came into the room and breathed on them and then the baptism? There is a difference, beloved. The fact is, is that when he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit inside to do his work. But when they experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, 
They were now inside God. And they received more power. The Holy Spirit provides us with all we need to do as Peter did. The baptism in the Holy Spirit enhances and encourages our ability to follow. In my house, when I bought my house, um, it had, uh, I think it had 100 amp service. Well, today with you know, all of the stuff that we got, electronics, we need more than that. We need 200 amp service. In fact, I know houses that have 500 amp service. And in between. More power because it needs to do more. Right now I have two cars that have six cylinder. And I've decided I've lived too long without a boat. But I don't have the money to rent a dock space, so I'm going to find myself a little boat on a trailer. But I might not be able to find the boat that would be light enough to tow with my six-cylinder. So I got my eye out for an eight-cylinder something. I don't care. It doesn't have to be pretty. It's just got to tow the boat, you know. Get it to the ramp down in Plymouth or wherever I go. My wife likes to fish. I like to read and I like the salt air. So I got to get an eight cylinder because this one, I'll destroy it. Why will I destroy it? Because it's doing more than it can. You can do more when you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit because you got more power. Why do you have more power? Because you're convinced. That's all. You know, I'm trying to think of something here. Everybody in this room knows of Billy Graham. Right? I don't think there's anybody in this room who hasn't heard Billy Graham. But there are things about Billy Graham you don't know. Right? You know you don't know. Because you don't know him. I mean, you know of him. But what if Billy Graham was to say, listen, Jim, why don't you and Janet come to the house and spend a weekend with, you know, going back a few years with Ruth and I. That would mean that Jim knows him better than we do, wouldn't it? He probably would be able to tell us stuff about Billy Graham, we never would know unless he told. Maybe some favorite little trinket he has on his desk or, or something along those lines. Or like Ronald Reagan, like he likes jelly beans, you know, or something like that. That's the same thing with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into us and gives us strength and power and new life we don't have on our own and never could have on our own. But once we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there is absolutely no doubt, no, no doubt in our mind or in our spirit that we are of God and God will use us. And I don't have to be afraid of anything. I don't have to worry about anything. God's got it in control. You know why? Because I met him. We spent time together, intimate time together. That's why. That's the difference. Are we saved if we didn't have the baptism? Absolutely. Am I a Christian? Oh, you're absolutely a Christian. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But you can get more. I mean, let me ask you. You know what happened one time? I got my credentials, my first credentials, right? And I'm at a district council. This a, a, I'm going to admit to you how stupid I am. And so I'm at a, a district council, my first district council, getting credentials. That night, I'm going to be presented. I'm going to be called up to the front. They're going to give me my credentials and pray for me. And that's what happens. The next morning, the district superintendent, who absolutely happens to be an executive presbyter with the Assemblies of God, 
I guess the best way for some people, especially those of you, it would be like he was, he's a cardinal. He's a mucky muck. He's big time. It's 8.15 in the morning. My room phone rings. It's Brother Almond Bartholomew. He said, Joseph, this is Almond. I'm wondering if you'd like to have breakfast with Joyce and me. And I said, oh, I already had breakfast. <laughs> he said, uh, okay, some other time then. There never was another time. Although we got to know each other and we become friends and I love the guy and, and I think he's, he loves me too. But after I hung up the phone, Judy says, who was that? I said, it was Brother Bartholomew. He wanted to have breakfast with us. She said, what'd you say? Where do we gotta go? I said, I told him we already had breakfast. She looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> right? And you're all sitting there thinking the same thing, aren't you? If you, don't, if you don't ask God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit or a fresh infilling, are you out of your mind? Why not? God will not force it on you. But you have to ask. And what, you know what? About the ne over the course of the next three years, I had a number of meetings with Brother Bartholomew. I got to know him pretty good. Uh, I don't know him as well as his family, but you know, I know him, right? And one day I'm in a conversation with somebody and they're denigrating him. They're saying things about him that I know are not true and not accurate. Finally, I, I just couldn't put up with it. I said, you need to understand something. Amin Bartholomew is a friend of mine, and I know him pretty well. And all of your information that you've just shared with me is incorrect, wrong. It even borders on slanderous. And I'd prefer that we talk about something else. But if I didn't know Amin Bartholomew, I might have thought those things, but I wouldn't have really been able to stand up for him, would I? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. You want to stand up for Jesus? Want to be a ranger? Want to be a seal? Green beret? You got to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus died for. Our soldiers died for us to have the freedoms and the liberties that we enjoy in this nation. But Jesus died that we could have new life and be alive in the spirit. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, as we go about the rest of this weekend and we might have occasion to visit with family or friends over a hamburger or a hot dog or a Coke, Lord God, give us the boldness and the wisdom and the heart of love we need to share the truth. Lord, we're grateful for everyone who has served in our military. But we're ultimately grateful for you, our Lord Jesus, who died for us and gave himself up for us. Father, take these souls now from this place I pray that you would anoint them. If some of them need a healing or a touch in some way, I pray that you would provide it. And God, I ask you that you would glorify yourself in us and through us from the inside out.
and bring us back tonight to discuss the boundaries that will help us to enjoy your spirit. And Father, I ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Oh, amen. Now, is this your last Sunday? Oh, would you mind if I open this? If, you, if this is too much, you close it, okay? I have something I just want to share really quick. Yes. Bev said to thank you for the card, and I know if I just stick it on the bullet board, nobody's going to see it. So, with special thanks to all of you, to know you is to know people who are kind, considerate, and thoughtful. To know you is to be grateful for the special things you do for everything you've done, for being the special people that you are. Thank you so very much. If anybody missed it, last week we had Bev's 90th birthday party after service. To the church, my dearest thanks for all the lovely cards and gifts. Each one is very special to me. Thank you for being such a loving, giving, so compassionate a church. I know the Lord is smiling as he looks down upon you. In Jesus' precious name, Sister Bev Ross. <laughs> yeah, so, Amen. Amen. You all. We I may be small, kids. but we're really close. <laughs> Not that we wouldn't like to have more folks come in, but Peter and Candy are going to, now it's not Nashville, right? Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. I always associate Knoxville with Kentucky. With Kentucky. Right. But that's why I get it all mixed up. <laughs> they're, uh, they're, he's going to go build pianos and uh, fix them up and everything. So, but let's pray. Yes. We want to pray for them. Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity that you are giving Peter and Candy. We just wish you would have given them the opportunity around here. <laughs> but God, we ask you to take them safely and Lord we know that there's stress and all kinds of things to work out with all the moving and everything Lord we ask you that it would go smooth and that Lord they would find their new position rewarding and Lord that God you would use them richly for your glory and every once in a while when they come back to visit family they would stop in and visit with us. Father, we also pray and ask you for those who can't be with us today because of illness. We ask you to bless them right where they are. And Father, we pray for those who are at work that you would bless them right where they are. But we are here. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we know you are here. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today is a, oh, the, the little people, the young people, they go down to children's church if they wish. Amen. We have a new fella. Amen. Memorial Day. We will not forget. Brethren, I know that right now there's so much confusion and so much turmoil that's going on and been motivated by all kinds of different things. But the fact is, is you and I live in the greatest land on the face of the earth. We are a blessed people. And right now, uh, well, today, we remember those who down through all of this time have given their very lives that we could enjoy the life that we have. Come across the little cartoon. Question, how much did all this cost? Anybody not get it? I know that, you know, we enjoy our hamburgers and our hot dogs and our potato salad and macaroni salad and every other kind of salad that we want. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But let there be a time when we remember what this is all about. 
because we still have soldiers fighting for us. And, and, and when you wonder why do we have men on foreign soil, it's so that we don't have foreign soldiers on ours. One of the things, the greatest statement was, we took the battle to Baghdad before it got to Boston and Buffalo. We need to pray for our leaders. We're in a troubled time. Our congressmen, our senators, both state and federal. <coughs> our president, and new, what, whoever the new president will be, we need to pray that God's will would be done. Otherwise, we'll get what we deserve. I don't know that I want that. But, beloved, right now, there are men and women all over the world protecting us, preserving our way of life. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name for all of those soldiers, wherever they might be serving. Lord, first I ask for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you'd bless them with joy, with hope, with courage, with wisdom. And I ask you, dear God, that even in the midst of their ranks, you would use them to affect those who don't honor you, who don't serve you. Let them be effective even in that battle and in that war. And Lord, we pray that you would bring them all home safe. We also pray for their families, Lord the families of those who have lost loved ones, the grief, the sorrow, and the tears, we pray that you would dry them up and that, Father, you would put hope in their hearts. And Lord, let them feel just a little bit better knowing that their loved ones sacrificed for all of us. And now, dear God, I pray that you'd help me as I share what you put on my heart for today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please forgive me for not putting a jacket on. But you know what? Somebody said something to me the other day. They said, you know, when we see you perspiring like that, it, it, you know, it, it makes us feel uncomfortable. Now, I'm going to perspire. I perspire if I look around fast. So, but this way here, it might not be so bad. So please forgive me that I don't have a jacket on, but we're moving into that kind of weather. And uh, I hooked up all the air conditioners yesterday and got them all working and then turned out it wasn't gonna be 100 today. My back deck hit 105 yesterday. Well, here we are, new life, new life. That's what God wants to give us. Last week, <laughs> somebody hit a button. Who was somebody playing with, who's got keys? Who's got a white car? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we just kind of, you know. It just hit the button, brother, it'll go out. That's how it went on. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Amen. You know, sometimes I've done that. You know, I, I, one night I, I went crazy. I was sitting in, we were sitting in the house and I turned a certain way and all of a sudden I hear this beep like that. And I'm thinking, who is that? I thought it was my son at first, you know. And it, I, I must have looked for, I don't know, a good three, four minutes before Judy said, it's your car. <laughs> then I'm thinking somebody's breaking in. I get out in the garage, I don't have my keys with me. It turned out the cat stepped on the button. We don't have that cat no more. 
Not because of that, you know, she just, my oh my. New life, discovering and embracing the new life in Christ. Remember last week, Brother Button shared. Now, by the way, I, I made a couple of bad comments too yes, last week. He's not a pastor, but he is a minister and a reverend. Uh, pastors, you see a lot of people say, everybody's a pastor, everybody's a pastor. That's not true. When you see the term revel rep, you know, reverend in front of their name, REV period, or the, all that means is that they're ordained by an organization to be a minister of Christ. If they're not, a, you know, if they're not Christian, then they're a rabbi <laughs> or an imam, you know, from the Muslim or something else. But after their name, you might see something else. A pastor is a, a, a minister of Christ who leads a church and serves that body. That's a pastor. If they're traveling to other lands trying to establish churches, we call them missionaries. If they travel from church to church with a, with a message that God has given them from multiple churches, we call them evangelists. See, but they're not pastors. And if they work in the district office, if that's where God has assigned them, like Brother Button, well then he's Reverend William B. Button, Director of Church Development. So he's a director. But he's a minister to the body of Christ on a different, in a different capacity. See? Why? You know, I was at a meeting Monday with all ministers. Everybody was introduced as pastor. This is pastor so-and-so. This is pastor so-and-so. This is pastor so-and-so. So I said, you're a pastor of what? And they looked at me. And the one fellow said, finally the one fellow said, I think I'm the pastor of janitorial work. <laughs> That's what he was. He was the church sextant. You know, the fellow who takes care of the building and makes sure everything's in good working order. Well, that's not a pastor. It's one of those things that just drives me crazy. Is that going to be on there, brother? Good, good. As a matter of fact, good. Amen. <laughs> but last week, he was talking, Brother Button was talking about, and we referred to each other as brother and sister. That's, we do that here, too. Please don't be offended if I call you sis or bro. I don't mean it derogatorily. It's just shorter. And I use all my words on Sunday. So I like to keep them throughout the week shorter. No, I'm only kidding. He was talking about God's plan. Jesus came with a plan. And I want to expound on that. It just falls into the, I've been doing the Holy Spirit. It just falls in that. Part of the plan is God's Holy Spirit. There's a reason that he gave us the Holy Spirit. And that's what we want to look at today. Discovering and embracing new life in Christ because the Spirit gives it to us. In John chapter 15, I'm just going to read verse 14. If you want to jot down the, the, the address and look at it, uh, again, that would be good. Read the whole thing. But John chapter 15, and uh, yeah, right. Come on. Where are you? I moved my things around. There it is. Verse 14 reads this way. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Whoa. Sometimes people get this impression that, you know, uh, well, I believe that Jesus was born to Mary and lived a good life, uh, sinless, and died on the cross and, uh, and rose from the dead. Uh, so I'm okay. 
No, you're not. The demons know that. They don't even believe it. They know it. But they're not saved. There has to be a new life that develops from the inside out. Because there are people who can act real Christian, right? But boy, if you really get to know them inside. What did he say to those folks? You whitewashed walls, you dens of vipers. Funny that one of the disciples said, you offend them when you talk like that. You notice Jesus didn't apologize. Sometimes we get the impression Christians aren't supposed to, you know, offend anybody. See that? That offends everybody. That's why there are some Christian churches who feel compelled to take it down so that they don't offend anybody. If you're offended by the cross, you're in the wrong program. You need to switch to something else like Beverly Hillbillies or something. Because here we talk about God. Amen. Beloved, the reality of it is, is that we're in a plan. We're part of the plan. And God wants us to make a difference. He wants us to move from that old life to a new life. And the new life begins when we leave the old one. We can't stay in the world. He said, come out from among them. Do you know that's the definition of holy? Holy means you are separate from the world. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you glow with a halo. You don't. It means you're not like them. You don't think like them. You don't talk like them. You don't feel like them. You don't act like them. Why? It doesn't mean you never did. Of course you did. But you don't anymore. And when you discover that you are doing like them, you're willing to change. That's the new life. And it comes with a host of rewards and wonderful things. And beloved, that's what we need to do. That's why we are come together on Sundays. That's why we read our word. How do I do this? But we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I have to, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. It's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, the helper will come. And he will help you. Live up to this word. Understand this word. Have courage. Have strength. Have hope. Have determination. In fact, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. We're given the new life. We don't have to work at it even. All we have to do is be willing to surrender the old one. The Holy Spirit will do it. Just let him. That's what I find most Christians don't do. They don't let the Holy Spirit they work earnestly at trying to do the things they think God wants them to do and to be, when really all you have to do is surrender. He'll make it. He'll produce it. You'll start to see. You see, you perceive things different. You understand things differently. You even feel differently about a whole host of things. That's the Holy Spirit in you, and He's part of the plan. God sent him to you. You know why? Because God looked down on humanity and said, look at all I've done. First off, I created you. Everybody before the flood knew that. And they still drifted away, most of them. Then I brought about a flood and I saved only this one family. There's no question that family knows who I was and what I could do. And yet they still drifted away. Whew. Then I picked this guy, Abraham. And I bring him. I prosper him. I make him very wealthy. The Bill Gates of the day. And still, 
people resist me. Not everyone. Don't forget, Abraham met Melchizedek. And we know that God talked to Ahimelech, the king, tell him that that's, don't touch her, that's Abraham's wife. So some people were responding, but not the majority. It was getting worse and worse and worse. So God, I, it, what I see in the book is that God says, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to make myself so known to humanity. I'm going to lead this group of people, the descendants of Israel, Jacob, into Egypt. They're going to prosper at first, but then their descendants are going to be turned into slaves. Then watch what I'm going to do. And he does. He goes in there. They don't fight. They don't have to do anything, and God delivers them. In fact, the Egyptian people give them cloth and jewels and money. Go, get out of here, finally. In fact, God put to shame every god that Egypt worshipped. Then he takes them out into the wilderness, and because they sinned, okay, you stay in the wilderness for 40 years, they weren't out in the wilderness under six months after they just experienced what they experienced. All those things he did in Egypt, the drowning of, of Pharaoh's army, and they were already building a calf. You know, they're stupid, and then there's a special kind of stupid. And that's what they were. But don't be too harsh on them. Because special kind of stupid is still around. And it's contagious. They build a calf. Then he tells them, go in and score. Look, go in, get motivated. Go look at the land I'm going to give you. They do, but they come out, they say, oh, we can't do this. They're too big. They're big people, you know. So he said, okay, you don't want to go in? Stay out here. But now, I got to give you manna in the morning. I got to give you water from a rock. I got to bring the quail in in the evening. <sighs> but I'll do it. And there'll be no mistake that he did it. You know, when we hear water from a rock, we think, yeah, maybe it was like 100 people. No, it was close to two million people. That's a lot of water. It's a lot of manna. It's a lot of quail. For 40 years, he took care of them in the wilderness. Our God is awesome, beloved. He can do anything. There's nothing he can't do. He's not subject to limits like we are. And still, look. Compromise after compromise. So finally Jesus comes. Now we're going to complete the plan. I'm going to pay for the sins so that those who are in Abraham's bosom can be delivered, brought up into heaven, and that from now on people can have the strength to stop their way of life and have new life. And that's what he did on the cross. Died on the cross to pay for our sins so that those of us who would admit that we're sinners confess it and are willing to change, now he can send us the Holy Spirit. It's called voluntary cooperation. He doesn't force himself on anybody. No, it's got to come from the inside out. That heart has got to be there for God, like David. You say, well, David wasn't perfect. Well, neither are you, and neither am I. But fortunately, I have, we have a gracious, merciful, and faithful God. Unfortunately, the host of the world does not have that. Do you realize that 
Uh, Christianity is the only faith on the face of the earth that guarantees heaven to its believers, to its followers. The only one. It's also the only one that says, you can't do it. You just need to stop trying and let me do it in you. You know what we call that on Long Island? Such a deal. <laughs> you got to be foolish not to accept that deal. Or you got to be hard hearted. And that's what most people are. They want things on their terms, they want control. You and I are willing to surrender that control. Because we know if we surrender that control to him, he'll give us a better life. But the world says, I am not going to surrender any control. You're a, you're a fool. What time did your employer say he wanted you there on Monday morning? Are you there? You don't have all control. It's an illusion. And there's a host of other things. But see, they surrender the control, and, and so do we, right? A certain amount for this. Because we have to pay for this. And that's understandable. But you and I in this room, and those who are watching who agree, we've realized that there's a, there's a more if you will, powerful control that can lead us into places. Do you know there's a new thing out there? I was approached to become a life coach. How many of you know what a life coach, coach is? A lot of the rich people have them, you know. I have a life coach. His name is the Holy Spirit. And he should be your life coach too. So I want to take a look at one guy. We have to be his friends. So let's look at Peter. By the way, I'm going to use some other verses too. Here's Peter. Peter's an impulsive fisherman. He's outspoken. He jumps into action before he even thinks. But he's a nice guy. And being a fisherman, he's probably pretty rugged also. But when he sees the tide turning, something happens. You know what's interesting, I find interesting? When they were coming to arrest Jesus, Peter's the one that drew his sword and hacked off the high, the high priest's servant's ear. Now, fortunately for him, Jesus healed that ear, so he wasn't arrested with Jesus. That took impulse. I'm thinking, because of what followed, I'm thinking as soon as he did it, he's thinking to himself, even while the sword is maybe coming around, what am I doing? But the fact is, he did it. But later on, what happens? John, his family, is a friend of the high priest. They know him. They're friends with him. So John comes from a pretty prominent family. So when they lead Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, John goes right in with them because the servants of the high priest recognize John. They just let him in. But Peter's standing outside and it says, John came out to get him. John comes out to get Peter. And when he does, the servant says, are you one of them? What does Peter say? No, I don't know him. I'm thinking John's going, what? Well, come on in anyway, Pete. Later on, they're standing around the fire warming themselves, and somebody else says, 
Aren't, weren't you with that guy, Jesus? No, I don't know the guy. I don't know him at all. Why is he doing that? Well, he's frightened. He sees what's coming. He knows they're going to kill him. And he don't want to stand with them. But you notice, John doesn't have a problem. John stands with them. John doesn't feel that fear. Well, they're just two different people. That's all. Plus, John probably feels a little safe because, well, his family's friends with the high priest. Finally, the third time, and the girl says, yeah, I know you were with him. I th yes, you were. I saw you. And he, he curses and says, I don't know. I don't know him. I tell you, I don't know him. In fact, one of the gospel tells us that then his eyes meet Jesus' eyes. And he went out and wept bitterly. Turns out, when you get down to the nitty gritty, Peter's a coward. He's not going to stand up for that guy. No way. Ooh. But what happens? What happens later? See, later on, they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a two process. It's a two-point process. Remember, Jesus appeared to them in the upper room. And as soon as he appears to them, it says, in John chapter 20, he says, he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Why didn't they have the Holy Spirit before? Because the Holy Spirit couldn't come into them before. Why? Because their sins were not paid for. Now Jesus had died on the cross and rose from the dead. Sins are paid for. And they have a heart for him so they can receive the Holy Spirit. But later on, after Jesus ascends to the heavens, to the Father's right hand, they receive an extra dimension of the Holy Spirit. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's what us Pentecostals are identified with. They call us Pentecostals because we believe in that experience still to this day. And we've already, many of us in this room, how many of you have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Would you raise your hand? Wow. Amen. It's still for today. But Peter, everything changes after that baptism in the Holy Spirit. In fact, in two, chapter 2, let's look at chapter 2 in the book of Acts, chapter 2 and verse 14. The baptism in the Holy Spirit occurs. They're all in the upper room praying. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they, they speak in other tongues. Now, those other tongues may have been known languages and in fact, once they drift out, there are people who hear them speaking in their native language knowing they don't know it. But here they are speaking in that language. But some of them are speaking in what we call a heavenly language. It may not be a known language of today, but it, it was. It's a communication between the Holy Spirit and my soul with God. And they hear them. So they, they all start, I'm wondering, I'm thinking some of them are starting to laugh. Look, they're drunk. You know, they, what were they doing in that upper room, man? I think I saw Domino's, Domino's deliver, you know? And I think they got Budweiser with it or something. Look at them, they're all drunk. But now Peter is a different man. <coughs> Peter steps up. And he says in verse 14, Peter, but it says, but Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judah, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. You can hear him, can't you? And he, he shares with them what it is, but then if you would, skip over to verse 23 and 24. Look what he says there. Him, Jesus, 
being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Whoa. He tells them you're murderers. Now he stands before a large crowd and he's no longer frightened. Where'd that courage come from? It's the Holy Spirit. We know he didn't have it in himself, but now he does. The Holy Spirit changed him from the inside. Now he stands before this massive crowd. It says 3,000 of them came to the Lord that day. So we don't know how many were there, but he shouts out to them. He tells them, you did this. You killed him. And he's the one who sent us this. And it doesn't stop there. Look, go to chapter 4. Peter and John, you know, uh, are together. And uh, they're teaching. They're teaching people about Jesus. They get arrested. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. It's going to come. Persecution of Christians is coming to America. It's coming swifter than we might think. They come before the, 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 the leaders, the Sanhedrin. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 8, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for the good deed done to this helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all of all and all and to all the people, excuse me,